Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm grateful to be invited and honored, more honored than you are to have me here. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk briefly uh, today about immunohistochemistry. I'm sure we can spend an entire day talking about that, um, although I would not agree to give a talk on immunohistochemistry unless it was about common sense approaches uh, to staining, since I was trained by Dr. Cockrell, and I do not stain as much as uh, other pathologists, I think. Let me figure this out. I'll give you a brief overview, um, and uh, then we'll discuss when are IHT stains helpful, when they're not helpful, um, and then we'll summarize with hopefully a few useful points that you can use whether you do read dermatopathology or not. I know that there are some pathologists in the audience. If you have questions, please uh, feel free to ask me at the end. Uh, I know that some of those questions will not be relevant to the majority of the audience, which is dermatology, so if you can ask me at the end, that would be great. You can, however, interrupt me for any reason that you think would be relevant to uh, everybody in the audience. So a brief overview for those of you who um, do not like looking at the microscope at all. Uh, the, the other ones, you know, you could check your Facebook page for a minute um, if you know everything about this. <laughs> Uh, Immunohistochemistry is used to uh, demonstrate an antigen in a cell uh, in, or tissues, which it's really a specific antigen antibody reaction that preserves the structure of the cells and the tissue, and its primary utility is identifying origin of cells. And that's a really important point to remember because I think, especially in dermatopathology, this point is lost. So you have a primary antibody, it's usually a mouse, um, that binds specifically to an antigen. Um, the most common method of uh, staining in pathology is a two-step indirect method where the primary antibody is not labeled. Um, it binds to an antigen. Um, and then a secondary antibody, antibody in, in this case, a rabbit anti-mouse secondary antibody that does have an enzyme label that can then be detected using a chromogen is bound to the primary antibody and detected. Um, there are a couple of reasons to do this. It's a lot easier to just have, you know, a, a broader method of detecting uh, antibodies um, because this can be different colors. It can be brown or red. DAB is brown, AC is red. And also it allows for stronger signal, unlike this picture here, um, several of these secondary antibodies usually bind to the uh, FC portion of the primary antibody and allow for a much stronger signal. So let's, now that we've kind of overviewed that, just as a quick review, when are IHC stains useful in dermatopathology? In melanocytic lesions in general, they're really not useful. And again, I'm going to probably say several things that are controversial. And if you're a pathologist, and you're welcome to argue with me anytime. I love to debate things, but let's make it after the talk. Um, so in general, for myocytic lesions, uh, there may be a good, uh, a nice place for IHC stains for myocytic proliferations on sun-damaged skin. Beyond that, if you don't know whether it's benign or malignant, you're unlikely to find that out by putting 10 stains on, on a melanoma. Um, there are a few exceptions, of course, um, but in general, that is the case. They, they can be used for basaloid neoplasms, intraepidermal pagetoid neoplasm, neoplasms, um, lymphoproliferative disorders, and you've heard a little bit about that already. Uh, spindle cell tumors, you almost always have to stain. Metastases to the skin, you almost always have to stain. You can also use IHC stains for infe infectious organisms, and there are now more and more IHC stains for that. And even immunobullous diseases, and I'll give you an example where that can be used very, in a very targeted way, that is very useful and saves money, does not add to the cost to the patient or um, the insurance. Uh, they can also be used for prognosis and, uh, of course, in most surgery. So let's start with the first one, melanocytic proliferations on sun-damaged skin. Um, the main stains that are used for that are MART1, MITF, and SOX10, uh, more recently. 
Um, MART-1 by itself should never be used on sun damaged skin. The reason is when it's not, when a melancholy proliferation is not on sun damaged skin or not significantly sun damaged skin, it's not as difficult um, to look at MART-1 and not overcall it. And I'll explain why in a second. These are higher power views showing significant pagetoid spread and the confluent melancholy proliferation at the junction nested but also in single cells. Compare that with MITF, really doesn't show significant difference between MART-1 and MITF. However, when you look at sun damaged skin, this is SOX-10 on that same lesion. Um, looking at significantly sun damaged skin with a melanoma in situ that has an area of regression here, does make a difference whether you're looking at MART-1 or MITF. And if you look here, this is MART-1 on that lesion, MITF staining less of the melanocytes and SOX10 staining even less. The reason for this is MART-1 is a cytoplasmic and uh, nuclear stain. It not only stains all the nuclei of the melanocytes, it stains all the dendrites. So in different cuts that you're looking at, you're gonna be seeing significant what appears to be increased, increased staining. And in general, if this is the only stain you're gonna use, you're gonna overcall it, not just because of that, but also because activated keratinocytes are well known in sun damaged skin to actually pick up the stain. It is, however, a very good stain uh, because it's very specific. So in the dermis, you will be able to pick up any invasion uh, easily with MART-1, because you may ask, well, then if MITF is the way to go because it's only a nuclear stain, so we'll, it will not stain the activated keratinocytes and also want to overcall the uh, um, melanocytic proliferation because of staining the dendrites of the melanocytes, why not just use MITF? The reason is it's not as specific and you're gonna call everything invasive. As you can see, it's much more difficult here to tell the difference between uh, invasion into the dermis as it here, very easy. MART-1, junctional proliferation only, melanophages in the dermis, nothing else. SOX-10, I thought, was gonna be the best way to just have it all. SOX-10 is a nuclear stain, will be much more specific in the dermis, it will not stain the uh, melanophages and, and histiocytes in the dermis. However, since there was no literature about four years ago when I started using this, I decided to stain every single case that I was gonna stain with MART-1 and MITF, with SOX-10 as well, so I can get my own data. In my experience, with now three different clones, this is actually a polyclonal, which you can see gives you a little bit of a background. I switched since then to one that doesn't. Um, but all these three clones do show significantly less staining with SOX-10. So you will undercall a typical junctional non-acidic proliferations, which by the way, is not a diagnosis. It's a description that leads you to a diagnosis like melanoma in situ or early melanoma in situ. Just like, by the way, ASP, a typical squamous proliferation is not a diagnosis. Uh, it's just a description of what you're seeing under the microscope that then leads you to a diagnosis. So I just had to say that it's one of my pet peeves. <laughs> so here's the new clone that I use for SOX, with SOX-10 with no background at all. And you can see it really stains very few melanocytes. It's very specific. I do not know yet what, why it's not staining all the melanocytes at the dermal junction. But I think that relying on only this is misleading. And uh, there is already a paper that shows, um, in my experience, this is about 20% less than MITF, uh, which at the dermal junction theoretically should be accurate. Um, the paper that came out from Texas actually, um, sh in their hands it was about 15% less. So just be careful with that. The point is, do not just stain with MART-1 don't uh, overcall if you just use MART-1 and, um, and pay attention with just using SOX-10. And why I mentioned briefly, the reason that I thought this was gonna be it, SOX-10, this allows you to pick up the melanoma in situ and will also allow you to pick up any desmoplastic melanoma component that you could miss that can be seen under a melanoma in situ. So I thought, oh, this is gonna be great, but I, be, be careful about that. 
So yes, you can stain other malacidic lesions uh, with immunohistochemical stains. However, uh, there's, in my opinion, a limited role for IHC staining in malacidic um, lesion diagnosis. HMB45 can be used, for example, in blue nevi. They often stain, and they often do not stain with S100 and uh, MART1 and get misdiagnosed as other spindle cell tumors in the dermis. So this is a useful stain in that uh, context if, you know, it's a hypopigmented blue nevus. Uh, halo nevi are nicely uh, highlighted with MART1 stain. Um, this is a dual stain, an HMB45 that you can barely see, and KI67, this is a um, melanoma arising in a deep penetrating blue nevus. I'll probably show you more pictures of this uh, later or tomorrow, I think. Um, HMB45, a lot of people have been using it to look for a gradual decrease in staining with depth. As you can see, this is an obvious melanoma with crazy uh, proliferation uh, in the uh, upper portion of the lesion and minimal to no staining with HMB45. So again, uh, limit, in my opinion, limited um, usefulness. If you don't know whether it's benign or malignant, you're better off getting a consult than putting thin stains on it. And this is another dual stain that uh, I just did recently just actually to take a picture of it for this. Uh, and this is a MART1 KI67 dual stain, and this is occasionally helpful when you have a melanocytic um, lesion that is very, very inflamed. Uh, you can then tell the difference between uh, cells that are dividing that are immune cells, that are lymphocytes or keratinocytes, and melanocytes that are dividing. And here's a good example of a dividing melanocyte. And in the same field, you can see several other cells that um, are not uh, red, so they're not melanocytes, but are dividing. So this would be difficult to interpret without a dual stain. Basaloid neoplasms can be stained with multiple different uh, stains. One uh, that I wanted to mention specifically is TDAG51. I've been using this for about four years since it came out, and there, there are now also um, some data that came out on this, it, and can be used to tell the difference between uh, base cell carcinoma and follicular neoplasms. And of course, like any stain, not always, but it is generally helpful. It is, it, it's a follicular stem cell marker that does allow um, distinction between a follicular, benign follicular neoplasm and base cell carcinoma with follicular differentiation in most cases, not all, of course. Uh, so let me show you some examples of that. So here's a blob of basaloid cells in the dermis. Obviously, this is, you have a differential here when you look at this. You can tell it's not a basal cell. There's not clefting, but you can't be sure. You do have that in the differential diagnosis. When you look at this, I, I'm hoping the pathologists in the audience are all thinking this is Merkel cell. Um, and you can target the stains to go for what you're thinking rather than start with the panel of stains that includes everything that I had on the previous slide. And again, if you don't know if this is malignant, or you're considering some benign neoplasm, stains are not the way to go. Um, so this is obviously a malignant neoplasm, numerous mitoses. Um, that's why I showed you the high power picture. And this is a pancytokeratin stain. I don't really like that term because it means something different to everybody. In my lab, pancytokeratin means A1, A3 high molecular weight cytokeratins that I've mixed with low molecular weight cytokeratins, CAM 5.2, so I can just really broadly stain for everything if I'm looking for a screening stain like this. And it shows the very characteristic perinuclear rim, uh, uh, perinuclear dot pattern. And yes, that is also true of CK20, and classically, this is what you think of when you um, talk about perinuclear dot pattern staining in Merkel cell carcinoma, which this is. And another stain you could do for a neoplasm like this that could be useful is P63. And P63 does, has been shown to, um, when it's positive, um, show worse prognosis in Merkel cell carcinoma. So this may be uh, useful. Again, targeted staining can help um, really avoid 
20 stains on that lesion. When you kind of know what you're looking for, maybe you started with, you know, bury before um, and uh, cytokeratins, and then you went down the Merkel cell road, but you don't have to do a, a bunch of stains to get the answer. And this is another example of a Merkel cell carcinoma showing an even better perinuclear dot pattern that I literally had the next day. Um, ESA or BRIP4, ESA stands for epithelial surface antigen, is the other name for BRIP4 uh, from uh, some suppliers of the antibody, uh, can be used when you have very, very small specimens and um, can be somewhat useful. Uh, I'm sure that if you're a pathologist, you relate to this. If you're a dermatologist, you relate to this. Uh, I relate to both from both sides. <laughs> when I do a biopsy on the nose of a patient, I really want to do the best I can not to leave a divot. And I know full well that whether I'm looking at it or someone else, they're going to not like me very much because they're barely seeing stratum corneum. But I'm, I'd rather biopsy again than leave a huge divot. Well, occasionally you biopsy just enough to see like a smidgen of papillary dermis with three basaloid cells, and you're thinking it's, yeah, probably a basal cell, and this is a better example than what I just said. I just didn't want to be too mean because I have lots of examples of those. Uh, and in that case, you can use BRIP4 even for something as basic as a basal carcinoma to help you decide this doesn't cost any more, it actually costs less than biopsying the patient again, and it causes less trauma to the patient, but it leads to most. If this, those three little cells in the upper dermis are based on carcinoma, the standard of care for that is most surgery. On the nose, that's not trivial to the patient. So knowing whether that really is a basal carcinoma or not, even though you're just staining a basal carcinoma, could be useful and very cost effective. You're just doing one stain instead of a rebiopsy and possibly three biopsies. I'm sure you've all seen that. Uh, AKA, 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 and they're convinced it's a basal. Well, give me just three more cells, please, and I'll tell you if it is. <laughs> it's kind of like that. Intraepidermal pagetoid neoplasms, you almost always have to stain. And not always, but almost always, and this is a good example, and I'm, it's very fun to guess when you see these, and usually you're right because you have a few more clues uh, to look at, but uh, in general, they need to be stained. So this is a good example of extra mammary Paget's disease. This is uh, pancytokeratin, my pancytokeratin, and, and uh, low molecular weight, uh, and the CK7. Low molecular weight keratin looked exactly like this. So it was all CAM 5.2. And this was in the groin of a patient, so CK20 was negative. This did turn out to be a primary cutaneous extra mammary Paget's disease, but that, is a, that does require more stains in order to really be able to tell uh, or significant further workup. And I always ask for follow-up on these cases because um, instead of staining with 20 stains, the patient needs to be worked up anyway in the majority of the cases, so you kind of want to know, okay, what was it? And in general, when you ask for it, clinicians give, them, give you the follow-up, which I am personally very grateful for. It, it helps me learn a lot. Lymphoproliferative disorders, we could spend a whole symposium on, all three days, staining them, and you've already heard a lot about this. The point with this is use a screening panel of stains to start with. Um, I see these cases um, in consult occasionally and I'll get three trays of slides. I, I literally dread even looking at it. I find every other possible thing I can possibly do that day before I look at that consult because I just don't even want to open the trays. A uh, classic example of this is actually a case I got from a teenager from uh, Peds with two full trays of stains. I put it off as long as I could, and as soon as I looked at the first slide, it was an irritated skin tag. I am not kidding. So be discriminatory. I did not look at any of the stains, just if you wanted to know the follow-up on that. <laughs> so I just signed it out as an irritated skin tag. So clinical correlation is somewhat is sometimes very useful when you start deciding what you're going to go, what road you're going to go down uh, with these uh, lymphoproliferative disorders. It's really one of the most important things. And otherwise, start with a screening panel. 
CD3 and CD20, if you know you're looking at T cells, then go down the T cell route. If you know you're looking at B cells, go down the B cell route. But, and I understand hematopathologists who do this for a living don't maybe have the luxury of doing this. The case has already been worked up and screened, then they do 30 stains because they have to. But that's not my case. I look at these cases, usually biopsy from the skin, would they come in as an H&E. So I do have the luxury of, of being very discriminatory when I decide what stains I do the first day. Um, dermatologists I read for know when I'm reading, when I'm working up a lymphoproliferative disorder because they're not getting the answer the next day. If there's two days that they, and they haven't gotten the answer, they know I'm doing two sets of stains. If there's three days, then they know I'm going even more and they're starting to worry about lymphoma. Uh, and, and that's okay. G waiting with the case for a few days and doing step staining uh, is preferable, in my opinion, uh, to doing 30 stains that, you know, 20 of which you don't need. So here's an example of diffuse proliferation of small blue cells in the dermis. You could start with 20 stains on this, and I don't think anybody would blame you. Um, your guess is as good as mine as far as what this is, and it includes lymphoproliferative disorders, but not just lymphoproliferative disorders. You, you may want to stain this for Merkel cell. It could be leukemia cutis, it could be a Merkel cell, it could be uh, obviously a lymphoma, which is something that you think of right away when you look at it. And here are the stains on this, and you do CD3 and CD20 um, as the primary two stains that you start with. And this is clearly, the, these many, this many B cells are never okay in the skin. So you, you better figure out what type of B cell neoplasm this is. So then you do, CD10 is very positive, and you've already heard about this neoplasm just an hour ago. BCL2 is strongly and diffusely positive, uh, and BCL6 is mostly positive in the more nodular areas. Uh, this is a follicular B cell lymphoma and likely um, secondary cutaneous given the strong diffuse staining with BCL2 and CD10. And again, I asked for follow-up on this, and indeed this was a secondary cutaneous follicular uh, B cell lymphoma, but again, these patients have to be worked up, so doing another thousand stains will not help you as much as the workup that the patient needs anyway. Uh, spindle cell and fibrohistiocytic tumors. Spindle cell tumors, you almost always have to stain, right? Um, you're starting with the differential and uh, the panel of stains. This is the only thing that as a fellow, Dr. Cockrell, has a panel for, and obviously I do too. So you start with five stains. It's just, you know, you got to figure out which direction to go into, and the way you do that is starting with S100, cytokeratin, CD68, procollagen 1, and uh, you go from there. You, you got to figure out which way, what direction are you going into. But again, the first thing you have to find out is, is this benign or malignant, and that you're much better off finding out on H&E, and these are numerous mitoses with um, obviously atypical mitoses. So you start with the panel, S100 is negative, nice internal controls, HMB45 negative in the tumor, pancytokeratin negative, CD34, uh, which in this case was uh, performed, I usually don't perform it uh, right off the bat, was also negative, just showing the vascular channels in the dermis. And then you're going to the positive stain. CD68 is positive, procollagen 1 is positive, and CD10, which often is positive in uh, AFXs, is strongly positive. So this is most compatible with an AFX. It looks crazy. It looks like a melanoma. It, you, you choose whatever you want it to look at on, on uh, H&E. Uh, stains are occasionally useful for dermatofibromas that are very cellular. I almost never stained these. I didn't stain this. I just stained it for this course, actually. Um, and here's stromalysin 3, which is a better stain, in my opinion, than factor 13A. Uh, it's more often positive, and it shows um, positivity in DF um, in comparison to DFSP, much better. DFSPs are negative for uh, stromalysin 3, much better than uh, um, factor 13A. And here's factor 13A. In this case, it didn't make a difference. Often when you do this, the factor 13A is difficult to interpret to almost negative. And stromalysin 3 also, the other name for this is uh, MMP11, matrix metalloproteinase 11. Um, it, it's available, um, I'm sure, at many labs, not just mine. 
and uh, CD34 nicely negative. Often you see positive CD34 at the edge of one of, the, of these very cellular DFSPs, and I often get consults for these uh, to um, rule out DFSP because they've already been stained and the CD34 looks scary. And in those cases, uh, especially since you're saying, no, no, it's definitely not a DFSP, it, it is somewhat helpful to have another stain to just you know reassure um, the uh, clinicians that this is really not concerning. Um, SMA, positive in leiomyoma, DFSPs are positive with CD34, and metastases you have to stain as well. However, clinical correlation here is extremely helpful too because this is another time where you could do 30 stains to start with. I mean, you can, you'd name it, name the number and you could start with that. And um, ask, you know, if that's a, does the patient have a history of, base, of uh, breast cancer? Well, start with that if they do, right? This is a mucinous carcinoma. Sorry about that. I'm going to be done in a second. I don't have anything that important to say that I'm going to go over. So a mucinous carcinoma, nicely staining with CAM 5.2 and CK7. And uh, negative for other stains, you can try with mucinous carcinoma to tell is it primary or secondary. Usually stains do not help you tell if it's primary or secondary cutaneous. In this case, I guess that it was secondary cutaneous because of these other stains. And indeed, it was actually a mucinous carcinoma metastatic to the skin from a Barrett's esophagus lesion. So again, I asked for follow-up, and I was very grateful to get that, and it's kind of nice to know. And this patient, uh, it, this, these came in as two cysts on the back, uh, and on staining with cytokeratin and cytokeratin 7, you can see the nice Indian filing that you learn as a resident, uh, and ER, PR positive, breast cancer, and uh, upon questioning, the patient did have a history of breast cancer, but they came in as um, cysts. Um, you've seen all the other stains. I, I do look at a lot of pediatric cases, and in those cases, some, sometimes some of these stains are more relevant than they are in, in adults. And these come back, HSV-1, 2, and VZV come back in a day uh, from the lab, and you have to wait two weeks for culture, so sometimes it's really helpful because they want to know uh, which one is it. Is it disseminated um, zoster? Is it uh, disseminated HSV? Uh, is it a genital herpes lesion in a kid? That's obviously a very, very concerning um, finding. So sometimes those are helpful. And here's a picture of a CMV. And I told you I was going to give you uh, a, an example where immunostic chemical stains are even useful in immunobullous disease. This is an example of bullous pemphigoid. Instead of doing salt split skin, if you get what you're supposed to get, which is a biopsy of the blister, for H and E, and a biopsy of perilesional skin for uh, DIF, and you see a positive linear IgG and C3 to dorm epidermal junction. Unless clinically you can tell, technically you cannot really, really tell the difference between EBA and BP, unless you do a collagen four stain and you look to see where is the lamina densa located uh, in relation to the blister. And in bullous pemphigoid, because the um, antigen is really in the hemidesmosome, you will see it below the blister in EBA because, you're, um, at, because uh, the uh, collagen 7 is being attacked, you're going to see the collagen 7 nicely tracking, and I have examples of this too, I did, just didn't put them in. Uh, you see it nicely tracking with the roof of the blister, the opposite as you would see on salt split skin on immunofluorescence. Uh, and you can use these for prognosis, of course, and here's a squamous cell carcinoma with perineural invasion, nicely highlighted by a dual cytokeratin and S100 stain. Again, this was easy to see on h and &E. I stained it just for this. Uh, and uh, melanoma, um, obvious melanoma that um, I'll tell you more about probably tomorrow that shows, in, it, this is a, 20, in, a patient in her 20s and um, showing nice lymphovascular invasion that you really cannot pick up on h and &E. I mean, these are two atypical melanocytes in a lymphatic that's staining with D240. So um, you would not be able to pick that up. And in most surgery, they're very useful. It's easy when it's um, obviously malignant, but the problem is on sun damaged skin, we already talked about this, you really can't tell. And the merits of doing uh, most surgery for melanoma in situ are debatable, uh, and um, in my opinion, not justified, but that's a different discussion. Uh, but you could use, again, if you just use MART1, you're going to end up, you know, cutting a lot more than you would if you just do a primary excision. But you could do MITF staining on, um, on uh, frozen tissue, and this is an example of that. 
And you can also use it to identify uh, perineural invasion. These are all frozen sections stained with different stains. These are Merkel frozen section that I stained that one of uh, our most surgeons uh, took out and I stained it again just for here. And an extra mammary patches disease with CAM 5.2, that was easy when it's everywhere and you can see it uh, without needing the stain, but here's two cells left on the last layer. We didn't take another layer for that, but just something to know about. So when are they not useful? We kind of talked about all this as we went. Um, Staining to decide if it's benign or malignant, not a good idea. Using only MART1 on sun damaged skin, not a good idea. Indiscriminate staining without any clinical correlation, in my opinion, not a good idea. Um, if you're not going to pick it up, uh, if you don't really know what you're looking for, what stains do for you, they just let you see what you still don't know in color. So they're really not going to do a lot more for you. Just be mindful of how you use them. Um, and staining everything that's lymphocytic with a large panel of stain uh, is also sometimes even misleading and not useful uh, and wasteful, in my opinion. Um, and for all of these cases, get clinical correlation. And this, just for this talk, came out in the JAD yesterday. So I couldn't resist. I had to put it in. And this was a thing. Who accepted this is what I want to know for publication. This is a single lesion that was treated, an actinic keratosis that was treated uh, with imiquimod and then biopsied. And then they were worried about MF for a single lesion. Yeah, so what if there's pottery and microapsis? You're going to call every benign lichenoid keratosis MF if you don't ask for clinical history. This is a single lesion. The panel of stains that they described in the paper were not even worth the money that they used to put it in the paper. <laughs> they could have written this paper without even doing the stains. The point of this is it's a clinical correlation. Yes, you may see this on H&E, therefore, now that I know that it's a single lesion, it's not MF. No need for any stains. Same as with the skin irritated skin tag, you find out, find out it's a single lesion, you don't need to stain it. Thank you.